Kiff and Ange Productions, a Kiff and Ange podcast, the San Francisco Project Season 1, COVID-19. All right, welcome to Episode 2 of Kiff and Ange and the San Francisco COVID-19 series. And today we're going to be talking about zero hour for COVID in the tenderloin. I made it really dramatic for you, Ange. Um, <laughs> you because your you're voice. in the tenderloin right now. So you used your radio uh, yes. voice. Zero <laughs> hour for COVID in the tenderloin. So here's the thing is it's seriously zero hour. Okay. So what happened yesterday is word on the street was the St. Anthony's dining room was right. closed because somebody who worked there tested positive for COVID-19. So I live in the part of the tenderloin where Glide Memorial and St. Anthony is at, not the part of the tenderloin where they yeah. had the huge shelter that had 92 cases test positive. So my sort of theory was that the, it wasn't traveling yeah. through the homeless as quickly as we thought it would because the street tribes kind of, they don't really leave their tents because right. people will steal their stuff or yeah. the city will come along and just throw it away. Um, and they don't leave their resources, and that's the regular dealers that they have, you know, and the the social resources like food and, and these kitchens and whatnot. So now that there's physically a confirmed case, because I did confirm it with a friend who works at St. Anthony's today, that they got the email. Um, now that there's a confirmed case in my section of the Tenderloin, I, I totally expect it to start hitting the tribes over here, if you will. So I was I was asking somebody about that this morning, one of my homeless friends, and, and he said to me, But do you do you know anyone who has it? And I was right. like, What? And he's like, But do you know anyone physically that has it? And I says, Well, I got a couple of friends on Facebook. He's like, Yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. Right. He's like, talk to me when you know someone. And he just walked Ooh. off. And I was I like, like that guy. I like that guy. He's questioning. He's questioning. I, I knew you would like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's a little dangerous that, that the, the homeless even kind of might have a thought that this is a hoax. Because, I mean, I get questioning stuff. Okay. I know that before I left working in San Francisco, I had several encounters with homeless friends who were a little afraid. But I'll be honest. I, I'm not that connected with that community. Well, I immediately thought, oh, my God, the homeless might not have all the information we have. Because I had this other encounter with another homeless friend of mine yesterday. And she rolled up on me and, and was coughing. And, and, you know, we had our six foot and I had my face covering on and stuff. And I said, have you been tested? And, and she's like, I don't need the test. It's just a cold. And, and I was like, yeah, but, you know, they're saying maybe you should be t – it's not a dry cough. And I was like, there's more to it now than that. And so putting that together with this other encounter with uh, he, him believing it was a hoax, mm. I my conclusion was, oh, my gosh, well, clearly the homeless are not Ooh. as well informed as we are. And then immediately my friend was insulted by that. So. <laughs> Of course. Okay, I'm, I'm of so course. sorry. I'm sorry. Because in my mind, I'm thinking I'm sitting here watching the news like five hours a day. I'm so much more informed. I have the internet. I'm, you know, but. I mean, I can dumb. tell you right now, my I, I have family members who sit and watch the news 24 hours a day, and they are not masking at all and protesting places to open California up. So I don't know about access really? to the news that has anything to do with, oh, okay, with your okay. choices. Yeah, yeah like, it's just my little San Francisco bubble that I live in. No, I, I feel like there are days when I'm freaked out. I don't want to wear... I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to look at things. Like, I just... Oh, yeah. You don't even look anybody in the eye. And there are other days where I'm like, for reals, is this even a thing? The only reason I'm wearing this mask right now is so people don't, you know, chase me down and throw so bricks sure. at me. Yeah. I... Yeah. It's hard, you know, some... I Today I'm wearing a buff around my neck so that... Because I, I keep forgetting being a property manager. I walk out into the hallways yeah. and I don't have a mask on and I feel like sometimes I encounter people and they're giving me side eye for it. So 
Um, so I have a buff. And and also, I you hear those stories about people like, well, I think they everybody should wear it all the time outside. Oh. And and I don't. I don't think I should be wearing it outside unless I'm in a situation no. where it's crowded and I can't avoid. And there are sidewalks in the Tenderloin where you're either going to be walking yeah. in the street or you're going to you're going to cover your face. Yeah. And you know that's not necessarily a bad thing, whether there's a pandemic or not in certain areas. So there's that. <laughs> I was social distancing before it got popular. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and speaking of the tents. Oh, yeah. yeah. Know, what, what is it like out there? Describe for our faithful listeners the uh, the tents of the Tenderloin, because I know we see a lot of it really sensationalized, I guess, like Fox yeah. News style. You know what I mean? Yeah. People are really yeah. getting a kick out of blasting San Francisco right now. Yeah. Well, it's true. It's true. The tents are there. But, you know, let me explain why. And and this is what the rest of the country, I, I don't think, understands. In San Francisco, prior to the pandemic, we have a sit-lie ordinance, which allows the homeless or anyone, even myself, to go out and sit or lie down or put up a tent as long as it's not impeding the pathway, walkway, and sleep from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. If you call the police on a homeless per person sleeping on your sidewalk during those hours, the police are not going to come. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's that. But the pandemic has hit, and we can't, the, it, clearly, they can't stay in shelters. The largest shelter in the city had 92 people test positive while everybody was yelling, get them out of the shelters and get them into hotel rooms, which we're going to talk about the hotels in just a second. I got a story about that you're not going to believe. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So anyway, so yeah, so that's that law or ordinance has been relaxed. So everywhere you go that a property manager will permit it and there is space to do it, there is a tent. And and basically that means where people are not making you move every day and um, you know, there, you're not in front of a doorway. You're not impeding a walkway. Now, in some parts of the Tenderloin, that's a lot of tents. Yeah. They're not like six foot apart. No, they're you like, see it. You see the pictures. You see the pictures yeah, online. You know, they're right next door to each other. But what the tents are doing is allowing them to be in enclosed spaces and separate from each other. It's like a body mask, I guess, if you could imagine that. Um, but it's also a place for them to stay while the shelters are closed. Now, there are encampments in the city. Uh, Fulton and Hyde is one. And um, in response to the very nationalized lawsuit, you heard about that? Which one is this? Hastings Law School. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so Hastings Law School and merchants of the Tenderloin are suing the San Francisco because they feel like the Tenderloin is being ignored and um, it's become a containment zone, basically, which we've all heard that story before. And living here, I believe it, 100%. It's the, it's the Swedish model, Angela. It's the Swedish model. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's such a bad thing to say. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, I, people, I don't know. Oh, the socialists don't like Sweden now, huh? <laughs> well, but I don't think that there's a lot of differences there. <laughs> I know. There I'm was, just being. I'm being super yeah. sarcastic. I know, right? Sort of, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so so yeah, so the tents are going on, and they they clearly again we go back to the they're not going to go far from their resources. And in the Tenderloin, we have Glide Memorial Church, we have St. Anthony's, we have the Coalition for the Homeless, we have um, a gazillion social services, you know, uh, charities that are all located in the Tenderloin. So and, and now I, people aren't going to be able to access them. Well, they couldn't the access St. Anthony's yesterday. That was 2,400 meals that has, people had to find someplace else because of uh, one person testing positive from there. So, money's, yeah. Money's hard to find right now if you are a street person, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. And you, mean, mentioned, you mentioned nobody. hotels, and that's been the big controversy, though. Am I correct? Yeah, so that I you just see that constantly. I, I'm sure you, you've got to see it in the yeah. news. And oh, San Francisco's putting people in hotels and delivering drugs. Yeah, and, but and, they are—they're doing this. They are doing it, but see, it's what people's 
version of those things are in their mind. If they're not in San Francisco, then they're going to use whatever version they have yeah. relative to their lifestyle. So most people, hotel might mean the Hilton. It might mean Motel 6. It might mean a Marriott. Mm. Um, in reality, when we're talking hotels in San Francisco, we're talking about an SRO hotel, which is called a single room occupancy hotel. And it's a room typically without a bathroom in it. There's no kitchen in it. It's like a tenement housing. It, it is. There's a bed and a dresser and a sink. And you go down the hallway and you use the bathroom. And there may or may not be a shared kitchen in the, the building you're in. Now, they're not all like that. There are some that do have um, a private bath. My question is, how much, how much are these rooms to just the regular person? I mean, you always hear about San Francisco being so expensive. Like oh, yeah. So if you wanted to go and rent one of these rooms, um, and, and I have a specific hotel in mind mm. that I heard, I heard, I have stories about already, which is where they're being put. In the roach-infested tenement housing in San Francisco, it in is, the tenderloin it, that's only appropriate to house the homeless. How oh, much How much are they paid? How much do you pay a month? I... I don't know what they're paying. I, I don't know what the city has has agreed to pay. But if a, a person walked in off the street for one of those rooms and wanted to rent it for the month, it would probably be between eight hundred and a thousand dollars a month. Now, if you have a mass contract with the city to, and that's a hotel operating based on having vacancies, so you're never going to rent everything in your hotel unless you have a city contract. Then you get down to probably, and I have no inside knowledge on this, except that I used to own a company that sort of did this, but not for the homeless. Well, that I makes rented. Sense. If you fill it in, you're still going to make more money. So, so it's, discount. yeah. So like six hundred dollars yeah, a room. That makes sense. You know, it's like a cruise um, when you get a lot of people to go with you. <laughs> right. And so then we get into the argument of yes, now they've been put into I have two homeless friends that have accepted the offers to move into the hotel rooms and isolate. And they have ended up in the same hotel. And one um, had to bring their dog over to my house mm -hmm. for a couple of days because when he first moved in, his dog, he didn't realize, was running around in the hallway because a lot of the residents, you know, sort of had their doors open and they know each other because they've been around for a minute and San Francisco's not a big town. And his dog had caught a rat. <gasps> Yeah, and so until that could be situated with, another friend of mine that moved into the same hotel, um, for some reason, th when that person moved in, the, the window was open and pigeons had been coming into the room <laughs> and pooping all over the place. And the, I, the first person that moved in there had the same experience. And this person said there was like nests of cockroaches and that um, her ceiling started to cave in. So... Clearly, that person got moved, and you, you know, know they need to be I, put up in the Hilton because this is the Hilton's close. They're only <laughs> getting all the drugs and alcohol they want, and a thousand dollar a month roof over their head. Oh, no, so let's sorry. talk. I, I felt like I was being like kind of thing, and I I'm kind you were, of you were, that was kind of like wow. Ooh, whoa! And real? in reality, in reality, <laughs> I'm like this is actually not a bad thing because social distancing is very important, and no matter exactly. how like cold hearted you are, you have to see the bigger picture here. Exactly. So my then, Slytherin self is actually seeing the logic of putting people into hotels. And and let's talk about the drugs and alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Let's talk. Yeah, because. Um, we did talk about the alcohol and how you will, the DTs, I mean, you can die if, if yeah. you aren't giving your alcohol. Yeah. My yeah. question is, they're offering all this oh, stuff. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Are you done? Go lay down. Yeah, I've got my cat once in here too. Come on, Bubba. Sorry. Okay. Here's, here's my question. The city's paying all this money to home these people. Um, and in my opinion, the city should have been doing this kind of stuff from the beginning because the homeless crisis in San Francisco is, it hurts my heart. Like, it well, hurts then, my heart. Then the argument comes. But why aren't they not? I'm not going to advocate for them to live in a roach infested, rat infested, ceiling falling down, pigeon pooped room. And then you're taking the homeless off the street and putting them in a room with a bed 
and a table yeah. and saying, social distance, be here alone. For the first time in 10 years, for some people, you're going to sit in a room alone. Oh, and some people have got That's mental, mental mental issues. And I mean, <sighs> and, 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 and I also want to clarify completely that not at by any means are all homeless people drug addicts. So when we no, say no. people are getting drugs and booze delivered, uh, some people are just crazy like or it's, just it, di- uh, completely incapable and, you know of just taking care of themselves and that goes back to the how come the city hasn't been doing this all along well yeah. because these hotels that they're now being put in do not have the supportive services that the track that the city uses for the homeless have so there's there are hotels that we are they do transition from the street into but those hotels they have like on-site caseworkers and medical services and and it's much more support it's called supportive housing that that was going to be my question are they supporting just, the pay- people in these hotel rooms like you can't just so, be giving them drugs and all this stuff and then not give them drug and alcohol so, support right exactly so that's the thing is is all of the people that are getting anything delivered are already existing clients to caseworkers in programs that are hooking them up through other programs that are not necessarily right. funded by the city in any way, shape, or right. form, that are assisting them with their addiction and harm. It's called harm reduction. And because we're not going to put people in hotels and go, get sober, and that's going to work. As somebody who's gone through it, that's not how that works. No. I, so the, yeah. the best that we can hope for if we expect them to stay in a hotel yeah. room and properly social distance is to use harm reduction. This, and if, if, if you, you want to be cold about it, this isn't about them. No, it's about, it's about us. us. Yeah. Yeah. So existing methadone clients should not be standing in line at the methadone clinic behind each other. And if you put them six foot apart, you're going to take up a whole block on some days. That's stupid, you know, and it just, it makes more sense. And when it comes to the alcohol, that is, those are, that's organizations that are being supportive in harm reduction. And again, like you said, preventing death. And cannabis, here to tell you, compassionate, compassionate cannabis delivery yep. has existed in San Francisco for as long as I can remember. You can become a client of, of just about, there's dispensaries that are like super commercial now that it's recreational, but then there were the dispensaries that were medical and are still just medical and they have usually have compassion programs mm-hmm. um, that allow um, a certain amount of cannabis to be sold for a really reduced amount each month for a client or just given to them. Let me ask you a question. Speaking of drugs, what is it? Because you're in the tenderloin, what I mean, I'm and I'm sure you see some stuff. What's the drug dealing scene like out there? Like, how desperate are people to get their drugs? Are they still getting stuff? Because I was like, oh, how are people going to get their stuff when it was all manufactured in China? Like, what's what's the state? Do you do you know? Oh no, th- I, no, the stuff on the street isn't manufactured in China. That stuff on the street comes straight up from South America for sure. Okay. Oh, for sure. I thought like the and- fentanyl and stuff came from China. No, no, maybe, no, no, I, I, I don't see that. And, and really, the, the fact of the matter is, is primarily um, the drug of choice that I'm seeing being used yeah. most now in my area is crack. Crack is back. Crack is back, you know, and, and, and I can't, it's whack. <laughs> I can't not say it. Looks like a people with milk mustaches walking around everywhere. Is that what's going on? It's you know, it's a lot of people that I I walk up on to say hello to, and they I see it in their hands mm. stashed behind their back real yeah. quick, you know. And and of course, heroin has always been a popular yeah, yeah. popular drug, and you know, cannabis is just everywhere. So I, I saw, feel like I saw heroin sniffed for the first time on Bart right before this happened. I've anyway. seen it smoked a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm looking at half the time. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. It, I I feel like people who snort stuff would snort crush up anything. And the snort it. only reason I knew was it was because it was a, an acquaintance of mine on Bart who was doing it, and they felt oh, safe God. enough to do it in front of me. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how that works. <laughs> 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So, you know, I also wanted to mention about the hotels. Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. We talk about it being such a big deal in San Francisco. And I just checked some other towns um, and how they're dealing with the homeless. And um, some interesting things like New York, they are currently seeking 17,000 hotel rooms for their homeless to isolate their homeless population. And that was as of three days ago. So, mm. you know, uh, Las Vegas had a real interesting solution. You saw it too, I think. We talked about it when it popped up the picture on the internet of the parking lot with just the six foot by six foot boxes painted on it. You know. And you could totally stay outside this time of year in Las Vegas. I'm not going to say that. And it's open air. So why would you need barriers? I get it. I, 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 if it rains, it's going to suck. Part, part of but me says, why, were... why can't we start institutions that take care of the homeless populations like this in every major city? Like, why are there not huge, like, I don't know, institutions? And my guess is, you know, people don't want that in their neighborhood. You know, well, the whole NIMBY speaking, thing. Speaking from the Tenderloin, yeah. um, you end up, it, you ha it has to be spread throughout the city. And that yeah. gets into our whole navigation yeah. center yeah, argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Navig <laughs> I was going to say the whole navig the NIMBY navigation center argument is a whole. That's a whole other show. Yeah, we'll do that is. another time. We'll yeah. do that another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we? So. Maybe we'll walk away. Don't even look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I heard the Embarcadero one was the one to stay at. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna love that. People are coming from all over the world just to stay here. Um, Let's talk about that too, because everybody there's like a certain population on on Twitter and and um, Facebook of of people that are either work in San Francisco or are just new in San Francisco like two years new let's say yeah 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 they're just 100% convinced that San Francisco is providing all these services that you and I just talked about to people who are flocking here from everywhere else in the country let's well, just talk about that. I would like to talk about that now, how did they get here how are they getting here first of all because they're not hitchhiking because I'm not picking anybody up in my car with COVID. You know, they're not taking they're not taking buses, they're not taking trains, they're not taking right, trains, not taking right now they're not. They're not right now. They're no. you know what? Touche, good point. They're not right now. But you cannot it, deny that in the past that there is a history of busing people into larger cities. Like that oh, you know, they'll get sent. Them. They'll get sent into San Francisco. And it's then the weather like, in San Francisco is ideal for this kind of a lifestyle, especially if you're not a real down and out you know. The pushing around of the homeless is a trickle down uh, practice. I mean, they shuffle from one city to the other, then they come to the city and they yeah. shuffle from one neighborhood, and then now they're shuffled from one block, and then they're shuffled from in front of one building to the next. I watch them go from one side of the street to the yeah. to the other on on my street as the sun moves because they want to stay warm, or they want to stay cool, depending. So, you know, it, but. I, these are homeless people outside that have been here for years. Right, right. And Very that was always my experience is it was always the same people yeah. you'd see. And, you you know, of course, you I make mean, relationships with some people. And, and I've, I've known of people who've come into the city and immediately what they can apply for are food stamps and general assistance. And um, general assistance is dollar for dollar. And I think it's like $553 a month. So if you make any money, it's taken off of there right away. And if you're going to stay on GA, you have to prove that you're not capable of working or you have to take the work that GA tells you to go do, which I think is where some of our street sweepers come from. Oh, is that right? Yeah. There's also like yeah, the greeters. Yeah, I've, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I've met some of those so, people. Yeah. So this, this whole idea just that, a, Just to stop, just... stop. We're at 25 minutes. So do you want to think about wrapping up? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, anyway, you said the whole idea of this? the whole Just the whole idea of, of, of people flocking here and just living this great lifestyle during a pandemic and, and just not doing anything for it is a myth. No. is really what it boils down yeah. to. Yeah. Any communication I've had with the, the homeless population has been genuine fear right now. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, I think that's just a commonality between all people right now. Yeah, yeah, and and the tolerance is is much greater. The vibe is is very different. Is that know? true? Like, how is the vibe right now? Is it 
I, I feel like when I go out and see people and, and my mom and my friends tell me it's because my personality is kind of friendly, that people are, are genuinely nice. But I've heard very opposite experiences from people. Well, so I'm I'm real tight with my community on my and my community is what my block right between two streets that's it that block um, and I find that my community we are watching after each other both the homed and the unhomed um, there are shut-ins that have first floor windows and the homeless know them and they're taking care of them and getting them things because these are shut-ins that are yeah. in subsidized housing that you know they're 80 years old they don't have a computer they're not ordering on Amazon Aww. you know the corner shops are giving a little bit more credit to people that have to wait between you know their um, their checks oh that's so and, awesome this is a good way to yeah. end this because that's a nice positive outlook I love that I love hearing the positive yeah yeah and and you know handing out bandanas and face masks and you know just and the corner stores are the heroes. You know, you go into Walgreens, there's nothing. Corner stores got it all. Dude, that's how I feel. They got it all. The Mercado but, down the way is the place to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I mean, we're, it's, we're, we're living in the, in my community, in my bubble, my one black bubble. We're, we're doing okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Well, that's, that's good, except for. Except for you know somebody who's got the Rona, or you know that yeah. there's somebody there who's got the Rona, and yeah, yeah. now it's within a block. I, and I look at it like distance wise, like <clears throat> the tribes. The tribes will intertwine. So my question for you is: Have you gotten tested? I have been tested, and and I think we're going to talk about that in an upcoming show. That's right. We're going to have uh, that. Go ahead and lead out with that. Go yes, I have been tested, and we're going to talk about that on our next. Yeah, show. go ahead. I ha I have been tested, and I am excited to tell you Ooh. guys all about it on our next show. Ooh, <laughs> so listen up, episode three, and gets a big old Q-tip put up her nose. Oh yeah, oh. it was so special. Did you well, really? Is that how it well, happened? Yeah. Oh, well Listen up. <laughs> we'll tell you about it coming up. The opinions and topics discussed in any Kiff and Ange production or show are meant to be controversial, provocative, and possibly create a conversation that is not already being had. The most important thing to remember about this production is that it has zero educational or historical value other than from a purely popular parody perspective. By listening to this podcast, you understand that it is solely for entertainment purposes. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching parody, scholarship and research. Kiff and Ange Productions is meant to provide parody in an already difficult life. If you find no humor or entertainment in our productions, well, for goodness sakes, don't listen. 